welcome to the First Congregational Church of North Brookfield. Let's please stand together as we start our morning together with worship.
are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place I worship you I worship you you are here moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Please be seated. And a nice Sunday warm welcome to our pastor, Joe Shea. That's not very warm. (laughs) I I feel the love, thank you. (laughs) Okay. 
Just a few announcements, as always. Uh, Family Fall Festival is this coming Saturday, noon to four o'clock. So please uh, come help, come and have fun. Uh, you can help by just coming and having fun. So please come. Um, and praying for no rain, that's true. Uh, new members class that we have uh, scheduled to talk about new members uh, is on the 12th after the service, just keep that in mind. Um, our Caring Ministry Summit that Judy talked about last week, there's a sign up out in the parlor, uh, that'll be on November 3rd, and so please uh, stop out into the parlor and sign up for that. Uh, if you're new, uh, we have a meal after every service, uh, just down the hall, and everyone's invited. If you're new, we have information cards. If you feel like filling out your information, that'd be great. We will not stalk you much. Um, uh, but, uh, but please fill out the information. And uh, we also take prayer requests. Uh, if you fill out a prayer request, this is both information and a prayer request. You can fill out a prayer request, put it in the envelope when it comes by. You can send a prayer request to firstchurchnb.org, prayer at firstchurchnb.org also. But at this point, we pray for the things that are urgent, the things that our body needs to be aware of. Um, and otherwise, you can put your prayer request in the uh, offering or send uh, an email. So this is our list of extended community. We just put that there so we are thinking and remembering of them. And perhaps as we're praying, uh, you can be praying for the names that are on that list as well, or and, and even more, connect with those people during the week. Um, a few requests that I have right now. Um, just um, is to just be continuing to pray for the Jaritzma family. Greg lost his brother Lance this past week, and it was a sudden thing. We want to be praying for the Jaritzma family. Um, pray for our women. We have uh, 10 women that are on a retreat up in New Hampshire, including my wife. And so we want to pray that they uh, get home safely because even for two days, I'm lost. So um, um, we want to be praying for uh, this box that's here for Hope Armenia. Uh, we want to be praying for that as uh, we prepare for Missions Sunday. Um, other requests that I should be aware of before we pray. I have a friend who has an eight-year-old son. His name is AJ. He has an inoperable brain tumor. So they've um, done some radiation treatments I'm aware of, and that's all I know right now. Thank you. I have written down here, I didn't say, but Mary McGrail is having back spasms right now. We want to be praying for Mary. Other requests we should be aware of. Uh, yes. Can we continue to pray for Hope Armenia? Yes. We have their financial struggles and the unrest in the region. It's kind of, we need prayer. Yep. That's, and I just mentioned the box that's here. Yeah. yeah. My coworker Mike, his, his daughter, Victoria, is responding well to the experimental treatment. So she had blood work done this week and uh, they had positive results. So they might actually help the dosage, but it's actually shrunk the tumor 10%. Great. Praise God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd just like to ask our community of prayer for the uh, Middle East of Israel. Um, this is just terrible process going on there. We need to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Agreed. Uh, that's actually a, 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 a part of the, of the sermon today is as well. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we come before you now with uh, all of our spoken requests, but we also bring to you to this place right now all of those prayers that are unspoken, perhaps that are too private or too difficult to even talk about. And so, Lord, we, we lift up those requests to you as well. Um, Lord, we pray that, that we would not just request prayers, but that we would answer prayers as well and be your vehicle. We continue to pray for Hope Armenia and the unrest that's there and 
Uh, we just pray for the finances needed for that mission as well as all of our missionaries. We pray, Lord, for our extended community and we lift up Greg uh, Jaritzma and the Jaritzma family to you with the loss of, the, of uh, Greg's brother Lance. We pray for our women on the retreat to come home refreshed, but to be able to come home safely. We lift up Mary and the back spasms that she is having. And we pray, Lord, for AJ for having a brain tumor and being so young. And we just, our hearts are poured out and we pray for healing and for your comfort to the family and to AJ. We thank you for Victoria and for positive results. And we continue to pray for her, for Mike, and for the family. And Lord, we do lift up the Middle East to you and all that is going on there. And uh, we just trust in your sovereignty and uh, show us how we may be able to be helpful in this situation. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and we pray over the remainder of this service as we look to your word. May you speak uh, loudly uh, may your spirit be present to convict and challenge and transform. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we continue going through the Gospel of Luke and we have journals. If you're new and you'd like a journal that has the text of the Bible, the Gospel of Luke on one side and notes on the other, just raise your hand and we can have one sent over, brought over to you. Looks like we're all set, great. Okay, so we continue. Today we're looking at chapter 7, verses 1 through, uh, through 35. And uh, what we have been seeing is we looked at the pre-formal history of Jesus before he began his ministry. We're looking now at his Galilean ministry, the time that he is spending in northern uh, Israel ministering, and we've seen the calling of the apostles and how that was linked together through a number of uh, stories. We went through and completed the last time the Sermon on the Plain, and, uh, and, and we walked through that, and today we start a new section, and I'm just calling it three different responses. Jesus is responding three different ways through three different stories, and yet all three of these stories are interconnected, and we're going to look at that. And this is, the, this is the text of the three stories combined, and the centurion, the story of the Roman centurion is what we'll look at today. Uh, the next story is Jesus raises a widow's son. Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead. And then the third part, the third story, are John the Baptist's disciples going to Jesus and asking, are you the one? John is in prison. Luke has already told us that John is in prison. And so here the disciples of John, two of them are sent from John asking Jesus, are you the one? And so we'll look at that. Uh, but this week, we're just looking at this story, just these 10 verses. That's not all, but, but we're looking at in Luke those 10 verses. So in Luke chapter 3 and 4 that we've been through, and you can go back to YouTube and look at that. Uh, in Luke 3 and 4, Jesus talks about... Uh, well, Luke, rather, writes about John's ministry, uh, this widow of Sidon Jesus talks about, and this person, Naaman of Syria. And in Luke chapter 7, after the Sermon on the Plain, talking about forgiving, giving, and loving your enemies, 
Jesus tells these three stories, the Roman centurion, the widow's son, and John's ministry. And so it's interesting that what, what Jesus starts in chapters 3 and 4, and, and what happens is uh, in John's ministry is talked about, but then Jesus is in Nazareth, his hometown, and he enrages his audience of Jewish uh, his Jewish audience, because he's challenging them about the message going outside of Judaism. And, and this is offensive. And so Jesus talks about a story with the prophet Elijah about a widow in Sidon, which is in Lebanon today. So a Gentile woman uh, who uh, he raises this widow's son And and that takes place outside. Jesus mentions this outside of the the Jewish territory. And then he talks about the prophet Elisha, who uh, is in the same time frame as Elijah. He is after Elijah. But Elisha uh, ministers to a man named Naaman, who's from Syria, another outside of the Jewish territory. And Jesus said, to them, uh, and this is also a time, we go back and you can look at that sermon, but this is also a time in Israel where they're not following God, not in any way, shape, or form, they're not following God. And, And so, ministry happens to those outside of Jerusalem, outside of, I'm sorry, outside of the Israel. And so when Jesus mentions this, they are so enraged that they they grab hold of him and they bring him out to the edge of a cliff. They're going to throw him off a cliff. They're so enraged of what he's saying. So Jesus says these two stories and he upsets them. And then we find that the Roman centurion, the widow's son, and John's ministry are the next three stories that we're looking at. But, but John's ministry connects to John's ministry. And the widow of Sidon connects to the widow whose son he raises from the dead in the stories in Luke 7, and Naaman of Syria connects to the story of the Roman centurion. In in a way that, because of the way it's laid out, we're we're driven to this conclusion that, that Jesus is referencing and connecting Naaman of Syria to the Roman centurion, and the question is, what is the connection? What's the connection between this story that takes place around 850 BC and a story that takes place right there after Jesus proclaims and preaches this sermon on the plain? What is it about Luke chapter 7? And, and, and why did Luke put these three stories after the Sermon on the Plain about giving, forgiving, and loving your enemies? This, we, we need to pay attention to the layout of the text as well and not just look at paragraph by paragraph or chapter by chapter. So sometimes, you know, I, I get asked and sometimes I even question topical sermons or a sermon series through a book, a a sermon series on a topic or a sermon series that takes you through a book in the Bible, which is better? And there there are people who would say a book in the Bible and there are others that are saying, just give me some topical stuff. And which is it? I mean, I used to be much more of a topical person and over the years I've, I've moved more into a book person, and obviously we're going carefully through the Gospel of Luke. So which is better? And and the answer is, they're both just fine. Uh, God's Word has this ability to be living and active and to speak to us regardless of, of, of what's going on. So sometimes as a pastor, I would pray, and I pray over what to do in a sermon for sure, but I would pray over what topic, series might be helpful and beneficial to you. And and, and so I'm carefully thinking about what it is that will connect to you, and, and, and I choose scripture that I think will connect with you. And I trust that God's 
spirit present will do just that, make a connection. But I also truly believe that when we're walking through a book, that God's word is living and active, and wherever we land, it will apply somehow to us right here, right now. Right here, right now. So, so as we look at this text, uh, know that either way, God's word is living and active. We're all, perhaps we should all be aware of the atrocities, the horror, and horror bolded and underlined that is happening in Israel right now. We should be sick over what we're seeing happen. That's current. And I've seen the pictures on, uh, I saw one newsreel where a, a, a young woman that was abducted at the music festival and she was naked in the back of a pickup truck being spit on by everyone walking up to the pickup truck being paraded around like some kind of a trophy. And, and, I, and I saw on the newsreel, you know, last night, the, a wall that they've created in Tel Aviv of the missing people that are still missing. And it just went down the street and down the street and down the street. <laughs> and I'm shaken at the evil that can exist, at the depravity of humanity that can be metered out on those that are made in God's image. And, and, the, and what I've just painted and the mood that I've just created, I want you to keep. I want you to hold on to, as we look at Naaman, the story of Naaman, that I believe Jesus is connecting to in the Roman centurion story that we're going to look at. Naaman, it takes place in 2 Kings chapter 5. This takes place about 850 years before Christ. 850 years BC. And this is the text that we're gonna look at quickly. Uh, I'm, it's not my intent to do a in-depth sermon on this text because we certainly could. But I feel as though this idea of living and active and that what we look at can connect us to the current place that we're in seems to apply. Second Kings chapter five, we'll, let's just look at this part of the text to begin with. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. Syria and Israel at this point in time frame are at war and not at war, at war and not at war, at war and not at war. It is constantly happening. And so Naaman is the commander of the enemy's army. And it tells us something that is shocking to us. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, that that would be the king of Syria, with his master, and in high favor, because by him, by Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. So Naaman is given a victory by God over Israel. And remember, at this point in time, Israel is not in any way, shape, or form following God. And, and so God is using somehow Naaman, the enemy's commander of an army, in his sovereign plan. And I, I don't get that. 
But it's here, it's, it's here in the text. But this is what, this is what I wanna look at. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She worked in the service of Naaman's wife. When we read these things, we might just like read past something like this. But I want you to take that feeling that I just painted about what's currently going on. This was not just a raid where they rode in on their horses and said, oh, can I, can I take your daughter? A raid in this period of history and culture, a raid was a pillaging, a raid was a, was a destruction of. This girl is likely to have seen her parents and family and friends and community killed. A raid has taken place from this, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, a raid has taken place into Israel and they have taken hostages back over the line to be with them. They have captured, they have stolen someone's daughter. Doesn't this, now this text, enrage you more than it might have if you had just read it without all that's going on, that, that, that someone has invaded Israel on a raid, has killed and plundered and taken a young girl hostage. <laughs> and I'm chilled. And I'm shaken. And, and, and this young girl has every right to be anything but cooperative. This young girl has every right to be anything but helpful. She has every right to be bitter. She has every right to, to seek justice. She has every right. And, and she's clearly old enough to understand, and she's a person of faith because she knows of Elisha the prophet. She knows about Elisha the prophet and his ability to help people. And, and so what we see is she said to her mistress, well, would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he could cure him of his leprosy. I don't, I don't get this kind of thought process because my view would be if he was one of us, he could go to Elisha and perhaps be healed. But my view would be, <laughs> I hope he dies a leper. I certainly wouldn't be saying, I know something that can help. And so she is reaching out and saying, if you were in Samaria, the prophet of God of Israel could help, could heal you. And the king, uh, I didn't finish reading. So Naaman went and told his lord, the king, of Syria, he told him, uh, thus so the spoke the girl of the land in, in Israel, and, and basically he's telling him, there's, there's hope for me. And, and so the king of Syria said, go now, I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothes, a large amount of money, perhaps million, more than millions of dollars in, in money, some commentators would say, as a, as a gift, and I'll write a letter asking the king uh, of Israel to help you out. So... He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. 
The king is like, what? He's like, this guy's trying to pick a fight with me. And that's what we see in the next section, that the king shuts it down. And so the, the king of Israel said, and, and when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking to fight with me. This ain't happening. But when Elisha, the prophet, when, when Elisha hears of it, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? This is an opportunity. Why have you torn your clothes? Let, let, him, let him come to me that, that, that he may know that there is a prophet of God here in Israel. Let him come. And then we think, who in their right minds would invite the commander of the enemy to help him out? What, why, would you, why would you do that? So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Here I am. That brings us to this section. And here's what we find. And Elisha sent a messenger to him. He doesn't go. He sends a messenger. Sends a messenger to him saying, okay, you're here. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you'll be clean. He doesn't go to him. He doesn't touch him. He doesn't even meet with him. He just says, okay, here's the deal. The Jordan River, go and wash in it seven times, and you'll be all set. So Naaman is checked off. He went away saying, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me, stand and call upon my name of his Lord and his God, and wave his hand over me, some kind of hocus pocus thing or whatever, and cure me. And he's telling me, to leave now and go and dip in the Jordan? And, and he goes, are not Abani and Parfar, the rivers, aren't the rivers in my country in Damascus and Syria, aren't they better than any river in the Jordan? He's got this, you know, this nationalistic pride that he's I'm not gonna go dip myself in the Jordan when I've got better rivers, and they are better rivers. Uh, they're, they're fed from the snow-capped mountains, and I've been there, and, and we've seen what the Jordan looks like as it flows into the Sea of Galilee, and we've seen what it looks like as it's getting closer to the sea, uh, to the Dead Sea. <laughs> it's, it's not, there's no comparison. Uh, it's pretty dirty water. Are not the rivers in Damascus better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turns away in a rage. No humility, no, no consideration. And his servants come to him and said, my, my father, it's a, it's a great word. The prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? He's actually said to you, just wash and be clean. Why? Why wouldn't you do it? And so we get to this section, the last section. He gives in. Naaman gives in. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. The king of the enemy's army has just been made clean by the prophet of God in Israel. Then he returned to the man of God. He went back. He returned to the man of God and all of his company, and he came and stood before him, and now they meet. And, and behold, he said, behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. I know that your God is the only God 
in existence, hands down, I'm a believer. Please take this present, this gift that I brought. And, and Alicia said, uh, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, if not, please, let there be given to your servant. Give me two mule loads of earth, for from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any god but the Lord. Why two, why two mule loads of earth? He's, he's going to make an altar. He's, he's going to create a holy space of Israel's land in Syria. Wow. And, and, and then he goes on and he, and he says this, in this matter may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master, when the king of Syria, when the king of Syria goes to the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, making me bow down, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow myself in the house of Rimon, may the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. I'm not worshiping but I'm going to have to go back and play a role, and could I be pardoned for that? And, and part of me is saying, why isn't Alicia just saying, set up camp here? You can now be the commander of our armies. We have, you have intelligence data that we need. You know, you know use the money that you brought for, for, for us to go. Nothing like that. He sends him back to his land with two mule loads of dirt to worship God on the soil of Israel in Syria. A changed man. A changed life. And, 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 the, and the question that begs an answer is, should we as Christians be willing to minister to the commander of an evil army? And I, I don't even know how to answer this. Be, because we, we live in a place of, of tension here. There, there is this text. There is the text of Jesus saying, love your enemies. He didn't say love your enemies except those that are really, really evil. He just didn't qualify it. He said to love your enemies. And, and yet there's very clear indications in the Old Testament and in the New Testament of administering justice. And, and Jesus isn't dismantling uh, the, the Roman centurion, which we're going to get to. He's not telling him to stop being a soldier. And he's not, he's, he's not you know, defunding the Roman soldiers. He's, he's what do we do? when we see these conflicting texts of, of minister to the enemy and yet stop the evil and we're called to do both. We're, we're to be stretched as if we had an arm here and an arm there and we're to be stretched between the two because it's in that stretching that we find Christ on the cross. That, that, that we somehow have to prayerfully, carefully figure out how we minister to our enemies and yet fight the fight against evil where it exists. How do we navigate these waters? We don't know. We don't know what happened to Naaman. That's the last we hear of him. But I'm sure that he was used by God. I'm sure that in some significant way, Naaman was able to do something that promoted peace, that, that promoted the God of Israel as he continued to worship and pray because he did continue to worship and pray. 
That's why he took the land. Okay, so connecting the story of the centurion, this 10 verses in Luke that we're almost close to getting to, the centurion story, connecting it, both of the main characters are commanders of military. Both are commanders, military commanders. Um, there's a Jewish prophet healer as the other main character. Elisha and Jesus. Both are highly respected. The, the military commanders, they're both highly respected in the story. They're both outsiders of the Jewish faith. They're both outsiders. They were both communicated through, to through messengers. They, they weren't communicated to face-to-face, -face, but through messengers. Do you see why this is, that, that Luke is writing and how he's writing this, the, the connection, the, the healing points to the sovereignty and the power and the authority of God. There is no contact made to the person who is being healed. It is done from a distance. So these stories are connected. So let's look at the centurion story. And here we go. After he had finished all of his sayings, after he had finished the Sermon on the Plain, after he had finished all these sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Capernaum is, the, is a seaside a city on the, on the north, a little bit eastern side of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum. Now, there's a centurion who had a servant who was sick. So the difference here is the servant is sick, not the leader, but there's some, so there's some inversions. It's kind of interesting. I'm not going to go too far into all of those. You could go back and see all of the differences that are flipped in the story. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. He sends messengers. He doesn't go himself, he sends messengers. And he's sending elders of the Jewish community in Capernaum. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded. This is an imperfect tense, pleaded. They really pleading continuously. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, he's worthy. This Roman centurion is worthy of your attention. He's worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation. And he is the one who built our synagogue. I've been in Capernaum. I've stood at this synagogue right across the street from Peter's house. I've, I've seen, physically seen, the synagogue the Roman centurion built. <laughs> he built the synagogue. For he loves our nation. He is the one who built our synagogue. And so Jesus went with them. Can, can you imagine the disciples you know, maybe they were sitting down when the messengers came and, and Jesus hears that a Roman centurion servant needs help. And, and Jesus just said, I'll go. And can you imagine as he's getting up, perhaps one of the disciples going, whoa, 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 slow. think this through. Rome is our oppressors. They are the enemy. Are, are you saying that you're going to go to his house? Make yourself unclean and heal someone who's connected to the very people we want to see thrown out of here? Can, can you see the concern on some of the disciples' face saying, what? And, and yet Jesus gets up to go. Now, this is interesting. Uh, uh, this is an inscription outside of the Bible. This is an inscription that is found um, in, in the uh, early first century uh, where Libya is today, an inscription. This was commonplace for someone wanting to, to get up in the world. They humbled themselves. See, see this? Uh, this is an inscription 
that was later put on a pole in the middle of the Jewish you know, community uh, in this place, but perhaps there was one in Capernaum too. Here's what it said. Whereas, this is a different person, but whereas Marcus, uh, Titius, Asestos, I can't even think about pronouncing these names, son of Amelia, the man of exceptional merit after his assumption of office as procurator, carried out his public responsibilities in a generous and distinguished manner, and in his conduct continues to display such a conciliatory attitude that his presence is no burden to either the people in general or to anyone in particular, and whereas in the course of his administration that affects the Jewish community, he has sought the best interests both publicly and privately and does many things for us that are worthy of his reputation for exceptional notability, and it keeps going on. This is somebody who's helping the Jewish community and is making everyone know. The inscription goes on to say that it would be put on a marble pillar and that it would be publicly praised during Jewish worship. So this is the, the Greek culture uh, coming in and saying, I'll do this for you, but you've got to make it known that I'm the one who's doing it. There's no humility in these statements. So you have to wonder, did the Roman centurion, did he build the synagogue and stick up some kind of a statement to say, look at me and all that I'm doing for all of you, I'm worthy? It, it may seem that way that, that he's saying, I'm worthy. And he sends Jewish elders, the better connecting person to Jesus to say, uh, he's worthy. Look at all he's done for us. He loves our nation. He's built our synagogues. He's a good guy. You should heal him as though Jesus needs any convincing. But look at what happens. When he was not far from the house, when Jesus was not far from the Roman centurion's house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. He's rethinking this as Jesus is approaching. Perhaps he even feels the, the spirit tension in his spirit that, that he has just said to the king of kings, I'm worthy of you and your time. And now he's thinking, I'm not. I'm, I'm not worthy, worthy. He said, therefore, this is what the messengers are saying, therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let your servant be healed, for I too am a man of under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. The centurion is saying, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. I know what it means. I know what it costs. And and, and, I, and I'm a person with authority, and I know if I tell someone under me to do this, it's done. And, and you have the authority to just make this happen. Just do it. You don't have to come. I'm not worthy. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled. He was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. He's saying this in front of in front of. Peter and, and, and James and John who have left everything, the tax collector Matthew who has left everything in faith to follow Jesus. And he's saying right here, I'm amazed. It's the only time that we see in Luke Jesus being amazed at someone's faith. They're always amazed at his. And, and, and so they're amazed. Jesus is amazed at his faith. And he says, I haven't, I haven't seen this kind of faith anywhere in Israel. Trusting an authority that is just going to happen without me even being there. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. The healing took place. This isn't about healing. This is about authority and power and, 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 and humility. We don't know what happened to the centurion. We don't know what happened. Did he pursue Jesus? Did he seek after him? How about us, by the way? Have you been blessed by God in such a clear and evident way? Have, have you seen God work in your life at some point in some clear and evident way? Where are you now? Are you still pursuing Jesus or was it just a 
flash in the pan. Did it change the centurion's life? We wonder, we're left to guess. And I think we're left to guess. Luke leaves us to guess because he wants us to say, are we changed by what Jesus has done or have we just kind of shut down and are we changed by it or do we just go back to business as usual after we get what we want? Is that the kind of faith that we, that we have or, or, or do we just forget? Did the centurion forget what God had done? The gift, the second chance, the, the place that God had given him? Did, did the centurion forget? Do we just forget what God has done? Move on. How was the centurion used by God? How was the centurion used by God? We, we don't know. Or do we? Or do we? Now, I'm, I'm moving into a place of speculation. I think speculation is incredibly helpful, but we have to be careful that we're not saying what the text isn't clearly saying. The text isn't clearly saying we know what happened to the centurion, but I think Luke is giving us some insight in the way that he writes, because Luke writes the book of Acts. It's the second half, really, of his gospel. And, 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 and in this book of Acts, we find this in chapter 10, that there's at Caesarea where, now the, the, a centurion would follow, would follow Herod. Herod had a palace on the Mediterranean. I've stood there in the ruins where that was. And, and so if Herod moved, the centurions with him may have moved, and it's probably likely that this centurion being in this province in this northern part of, of Israel, that he was a centurion under Herod. And, and what we find then is that a, at Caesarea, where Herod's palace is on the Mediterranean, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. Really? What, do we, what was this centurion like? I mean, the other centurion was generous and giving and and, and investing and loved the Jewish people and seemed to be as close to God as you could be. And they never met Jesus. They, they never even met. They, they just trusted in this miracle. But, we, but he went back to doing what he was doing. We don't know what happened to him. But, but here we have a centurion who was what is the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Does that sound like a changed life after experience and encounter with Jesus? Uh, God-fearing, giving generously to those in need, praying to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. He goes on to tell him that Peter, a man named Peter, is going to come and, and, and come into his house and be with him. And this marks the opening of the gospel going to the Gentiles in the book of Acts. The clear and and, and present strategy to reach the Gentiles. And so what begins in chapter 4 with Jesus saying, the gospel message, if you're rejecting me, the gospel message is going to those outside of Israel, and they are upset about it, and Jesus acts upon it in chapter 7 by healing someone outside of Israel and then it all comes to pass in Acts chapter 10 where the Gentiles are now part of the Christian community. <laughs> so uh, how do we just, just close this down? How do we tie this together to where we are today? We have to be in... Vigilant prayer for Israel, 
but we need to be in prayer for Gaza, and we need to be in prayer for the tension that we're in, for justice and for opportunity for the gospel to be made known to these people because the, the hope is in the gospel. We need to be praying for our own enemies. Sometimes it's easier to pray for the, for the enemy uh, that, that is uh, combating against Israel right now. Who are your enemies? What opportunities uh, are available to you to minister to your enemies? How can you make the name of the God that we worship mean something? How can we present the gospel? I'm sickened over what's going on in Israel and and, and, and there is a, a good case for a just war. I do believe that. But I'm praying for Israel. I'm praying for Gaza. I'm praying for their enemies. I'm praying for my enemies. I'm praying for the gospel to go forward. We say in science that matter can neither be created or destroyed. I think problems can neither be created or destroyed. When we fix one problem, we just see another problem happening when we try to fix things outside of God's grace. When we fix something with God's grace, it is a lasting and an eternal fix that doesn't create another problem somewhere else. Grace changes everything. Let's pray. Father, may your grace cascade down even upon our enemies. And, and may justice be seen and, 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 and may the violence and the evil be stopped. And, and may we stand with all those that are being dislodged and devastated and hurt. And may somehow peace be found through you and in you in the Middle East and, and here in North Brookfield and in our families and in our lives and our country. May grace cascade down in ways in which there can be no other answer but for it to be directed to you. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name, the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
47. Uh, please stand if you're able to. benediction this morning comes from Romans chapter 15 verse 13 and I just think this is an important verse for us to walk out with may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit we can get distracted with all of uh, our emotions and and our disgust and, and our hurt from what we see going on in the world. But may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, as we move forward, 
We pray for the peace in Israel. We pray for those that are devastated and we pray against the evil and the atrocities and we pray over the hostages and we ask that, that they would be set free and, and we pray, Lord, for peace. And we pray for an understanding of how we may uh, be of assistance. But Lord, we know that we do not have to be there for this to take place, that you can answer prayer without, uh, and from a distance, without, this, without our contact and, and with a distance. And so as the centurion said, even from this distance, you can heal. Uh, we pray this now uh, for those in Israel, those in, in the Ukraine, those in, where there's conflict all over the world, our families and our neighborhoods, our country. In Jesus' name, we pray for your peace to be given and received. Amen.